Hello again, fellow Mystery Files. Today I am celebrating Women's History Month with a look at my favorite women writers, the Queens of Crime. This is a showdown between Agatha Christie, Dorothy Sayers, Marjorie Allingham, and Niall Marsh. I will be evaluating each of these queens based on 12 different elements of detective fiction. I will rank each of these four women with the top placer in each category, receiving four points, the second placer three points, the third place two points, and last place one point. That's a max score of 48 points and a minimum score of 12. I will not be spoiling any books, although some books will be referenced. And before I begin, make sure you like and subscribe to keep up to date with the channel. Let's begin with probably the most important aspect of mystery writing, and that is the writing itself. None of the queens of crime receive public praise for their writing skills, but they are all always praised for their plots and ingenuity, but rarely their writing, and they are all fantastic writers. However, despite that, this one was one of the easier categories for me to rank. In first place, I put Agatha Christie. And the way Christie writes most of her novels is like a roller coaster ride. You feel all of the tension and the thrills and the intrigue throughout your body. Reading a good Christie novel is like riding a roller coaster or making love. It's an experience, and if it's good, there's nothing better. She always knows the right words and phrases to get her point across without lengthy descriptions or having to tell us things. Her writing, even in some of her sloggier thrillers, is always breezy and quick without feeling like it's too easy or too simple. In second place, I have Marjorie Allingham. And I have her second because she's the only queen of crime who writes good thrillers. Not that the other three don't have good thrillers, but they also have like a lot of clunky ones. And I think Allingham shows wider range than Marsh or Sayers because she also does good mysteries as well. The Tiger in the Smoke is like my go-to example for good Allingham writing. She takes you on the journey and you feel as if you are a part of it. In third place, I have Niall Marsh. And I think Marsh does what she does well, and New Zealand and theater settings are superb, and she really demonstrates her writing of those places extremely well. Her final novel, Light Thickens, is such an excellent written novel in the way she incorporates Macbeth into the murder plot. I think Marsh is probably breezier than Allingham, but there are also more instances of impressive work from Allingham. And I think those early Marsh novels aren't like too well written, so she comes in third. And in last place is Dorothy Sayers. And I think Sayers is a great writer. It's just she had more, many more instances than the other three of like slogging and dragging. She does tend to get like bogged down and having too much detail. The Nine Tailors and Five Red Herrings just seem to deviate from the plot for history lessons. I think of like Whose Body is very sloppily written. I can point out more like poor writing from her than I can with the others. Continuing on with a few more aspects of writing and murder plotting, creativity of the murder plots. And this one was tougher than I thought it would be. I mean, the top two people I kept flipping, but I did decide to go with Agatha Christie in first. While I think the second place author has more creative murders, I think Christie uses other aspects of the plot more creatively. Christie will present an item and set up many different interpretations of that item. It's amazing how often she does that. You think a clue means one thing, but it actually means the exact opposite. Christie's creativity is not usually displayed in the actual murders, but in the obfuscation, the way she manipulates a timeline or with certain clues, the way her characters act. Her murders are often, you know, the basic stabbing, shooting, poisoning, etc. It's everything else around it that's creative. And I think when Christie is being creative, she's using a higher degree of difficulty. It's more difficult to pull off what Christie does than what the second place person does. And speaking of second place, it's Niall Marsh. I've talked about this a lot, uh, how I love Marsh's typically unusual murder methods and the way she makes them believable. So many mystery authors use like the wacky method, but the solutions are really just as wacky. That's not the case with Niall Marsh. Just some of her methods are like a gun-ricked piano, a pool of boiling mud, and the falling champagne bottle. Her mind was fertile with creative murder methods. And she also does the Christie thing of obfuscating in interesting ways. I think she does those well, but just not as well as Christie, which is why she's in second. 
And in third place, I have Dorothy Sayers. And I did feel like this was also close between Sayers and Allingham. Sayers has a few novels that have errors in their murder plots. But when overlooking that, I think she's very creative, even if they don't work. Like Christy, Sayers is going for that high degree of difficulty, but with mixed results. Most of the time, she does it well. I think Whose Body, The Unpleasantness at the Bellana Club, and Busman's Honeymoon are very good creativity-wise. Even Unnatural Death and Strong Poison, two books with scientific mistakes, are still very creative. And in last place, I put Marjorie Allingham. And it's not that I don't think she isn't creative. It's just, Again, I just think that Allingham is always doing something different than the other three. And that something just isn't as creative as like the traditional murder plots. I still think Allingham is very creative in the way she sends Whimsy on his adventures. And the twist, I mean, Campion on his adventures. And the twists and turns in those thrillers. But it's just not the same as what her contemporaries are doing. Let's turn to credibility of murder plots. Again, this was difficult. I think all four are very high variant on this issue, believe it or not. Some of their books are very good, but they all have more than one book that's just like completely off the rails. In first place, yet again, is Agatha Christie. And I think this relates just how simple most of her murder plots are. There isn't a lot of room for them to go off the rails. I think she has less novels that I'm left questioning their credibility of by the end, especially like in the traditional murder mysteries. Now, I am considering the thrillers in these as well, but I mean, not really to the same importance as the mysteries. But even then, books like Murder is Easy and Three Act Tragedy and Sad Cypress do leave me on a little bit of wobbly ground. I'm always willing to suspend belief for the sake of a good mystery, but I'm not willing to like throw credibility completely out the window. In second place, I have Dorothy Sayers, and this was a tough one as well. Like I said, Sayers has some scientifically inaccurate plots, but I don't hold that against her credibility too much because she wrote them under the belief that was accurate. I think Sayers has some grander plots, and the grander the plot, the less credible it is, but I don't think there are many Sayers novels that leave me thinking like, oh, that was ridiculous, especially when not counting those scientific errors. I think some ridiculous things happen in some of her books, but never to, at the expense of like the overall plot. In third place is Nio Marsh. And like I said earlier, Marsh has unusual murder methods. And even though she does a good job of making them credible, they're still ridiculous. Like, I don't think anyone would actually murder someone via like a gun rigged piano or in plain sight. That happens in quite a few of her books. I think she does those plots well, but it's, you know, it's a bit of a stretch to think someone would actually do those things in real life. And in last place is Marjorie Allingham. Again, since there is a lot of thriller content, I just think thriller content cannot be as credible as a regular mystery novel. And even her traditional mysteries have Albert Campion like single-handedly beating up large gangs and doing all sorts of like unusual things that are like more James Bond than a traditional detective. Let's talk about atmosphere. And by atmosphere, I mean, you know, setting, I mean, tone, I mean, like, the overall feeling of the book. And what do you know, in first place, again, is Christy. Christy always manages to evoke what feeling she needs when she wants to. And I think of And Then There Were None, and how spooky and how suspenseful that novel is, and also how it's, like, a little funny to break up that that darkness. She nails the atmosphere of that book in every way imaginable. She uses the setting of the island and the house to bring out those emotions, to bring out the tension. Even in other novels, she sets the scene well, and she sets a wider range of scenes than the other queens. She can bring to life a country village, a snow-stuck train, a steamship on the Nile. I always know what Christie's settings look like, and I always feel what I should be feeling. In second place, I put Niall Marsh, and I've talked about a lot of how no one sets his theater scene or a New Zealand setting better than Niall Marsh. The way she incorporates her knowledge of the theater into her mysteries is amazing. Opening Night and Light Thickens and Enter a Murderer are just a few of her theater books in which Marsh is able to describe without going into too much detail. I don't know anything about theater production, but I easily understand everything I need to know about it for her novels. Color Scheme is set in New Zealand, and she beautifully uses that setting as the murder weapon, essentially. 
Marsh comes in second here because I think in like a country village setting, she doesn't go all out. And I think emotionally, she doesn't have the widest depth. But I will say, I think she does like a London setting better than Christy. Christy has a few novels set in London. Other than her telling us that, I'm not sure I would like get a London feel like I do in Marsh's books, like Death in a White Tie or even the London set novels of the other queens. In third, I have Marjorie Allingham. Again, I referenced The Tiger and the Smoke for if you want a good example of setting or atmosphere. The London Fog in that book does so much good work, even in the other novels where Campion is performing feats of daring do. I mean, the reader will get a little thumping in their heart. There's something a lot of thriller writers just cannot evoke on page, but Allingham does it time and time again. Which brings me to last place with Dorothy Sayers. Again, it's not that I think Sayers lacks in this area. It's because she doesn't do what the other three are doing as well. In Have His Carcass, there are multiple fascinating scenes with Harriet Vane on the beach when she discovers the body. And there's her journey to help find help. And it's d very well done. It introduces the setting and the tone beautifully. But I just think Sayers' tendency to go overboard with information like in The Nine Tailors just really dampers the tone and atmosphere. The settings are always good, even when things like giving history of church bells and like in the five red herrings a book which i hate she depicts that scottish fishing and artist village beautifully but i do feel she has more mistakes in this category than the other three let's move on to another group of criteria involving characters and in this one i'm going to discuss the main characters the main detectives and again in the top spot is agatha christie and i'm only really considering poirot and marple here i know there's like tommy and toppins and battle and race and all of them but poirot and marple are the big ones and even like tommy and toppins are big but not too important for this discussion Poirot and Marple are two of the world's greatest and most famous fictional detectives, probably second and third to Sherlock Holmes, if even that. And Poirot and Marple are extremely unique, and they stand out in the field of literary detectives. They both know their strengths and their weaknesses. They know how to go about their duties as sleuths to get the information they desire. They see things the police miss. I think their awareness of their position makes them the best out there. And they solve fantastic crimes that I don't think other fictional detectives could. I mean, they of course would, because their authors would write that. But looking at Poirot and Marple, I could easily see them solving mysteries written by the other queens, but not necessarily the other way around. In second, and these other three were close, but I just stuck to the order I put them on my top 10 literary detectives list, and I put Niall Marsh. I think Alan's status as the only professional detective amongst the queens, you know, minus those minor Christie ones, is unique, but he also does go like the Poirot psychological route most of the time. He has a lot of subtle depth to him as a police officer, but also as a human being whose emotions are sometimes entwined in his cases and counter to the mindset of a police officer. He's not the typical gruff police inspector, but a rather sympathetic figure. I do think all of the Queen's detectives, Alan is probably the one who would blend most into a crowd. I mean, that's not in, really entirely his personality. He does like those, he does lack those sort of like grand quirks the others have. In third place, I have Dorothy Sayers, and this was very close. My opinion of Allingham's Campion has gone up recently, but I don't think it surpasses Lord Peter. I just find Lord Peter more entertaining and the better sleuth. I think he does more active work and solving crimes, and I think he does more interesting things. I love when he goes undercover at the ad agency and murder must advertise. I think there's a lot of depth to him in his relationship with Harriet Vane and his mother and like Bunter and Parker. I love Lord Peter's antics, even though he does get a bit grating at times. And I have Marjorie Allingham in last here. I always want Albert Campion to be just like a slightly less good version of Lord Peter. I think that's because Allingham sometimes designates Campion to the background character, but in particular in her later books. I mean, to me, he doesn't always just stand out in the way Lord Peter does. And it's true that Christy and Marsh also do this sometimes, but their sleuths are always the stars when they're on the page. I don't always feel that way about Campion. Moving on to the cast of supporting characters, and in first place, we do not have Agatha Christie. We have Niall Marsh. And if you watch my top 10 detective sidekicks, you might remember that three of the top four were sidekicks to Inspector Allen. And I think, like, 
Fox and Agatha Troy and Nigel Bathgate are just so fascinating as characters. I love how they are essentially treated as equals in Alan's mind. Troy is his wife and Bathgate is his close friend until he just sort of like disappears. But even then we get like Bailey and Thompson, the fingerprint and photography experts who are also treated as friends. They're so integral in the mystery solving, much more so than the other detective sidekicks. In second place, I put Agatha Christie. I think Agatha Christie has great sidekicks. I'm Mrs. Oliver, Hastings, Jap are all great. I've always loved Albert, who was Tommy and Tuppence's sidekick. Miss Marples are kind of bland, though, and like even like a Dermot Craddock and like Sir Henry Clithering. They're, to me, they're just not as interesting. And Miss Lemon for Poirot is virtually non-existent, at least in the novels. Miss Lemon does not appear as often as I think people think she does because she has that heavy presence in the David Suchet series. And that's the problem with Christie's sidekick characters. They simply aren't used enough. Their appearances are inconsistent, and it's largely because Poirot and Marple don't need sidekicks. I think they're great, but they just aren't as integral to the stories as Marsh's are. In third place, I did put Marjorie Allingham, and this is 100% because of Lug. I really don't care for Campion's other sidekicks. I mean, Oates and Amanda are fine, but largely absent from most of the books, and Charles Luke is just a complete dud, but Lug is fantastic. He's an ex-criminal, always trying to, like, help out Campion and fumbling most of the time. I loved when he was the new stall clerk in Trader's Purse and then trying to hide, hide the dead body in Coroner's Pigeon. He also has, like, this pet pig in that novel. He's just so much fun, and him alone prevents Allingham from falling into last place. And in last place is Dorothy Sayers. And again, I like Lord Peter's sidekicks. The problem, again, is we don't get enough of them. Every book needs more Bunter, and Bunter is just so criminally underused. And I think Harriet Vane spends most of her appearances, like, not wanting to marry Lord Peter, which I think really just, like, holds her character back. She's great in Gaudy Knight, but in that book, she's the main character. <laughs> she's not a sidekick there, really. And even, like, earlier on, I think, like, Charles Parker is a lot of fun, but he takes a back seat quite quickly. And, again, Miss Clemson, this sort of, like, private inquiry agent, I guess she is, is she's criminally underutilized, but I love her seance scene and Strong Poison. It's, like, one of my favorite scenes in all of detective fiction. The final character category here is, you know, the other characters, the one-time appearances, especially, you know, the murderers and the culprits. In first place is, once again, Agatha Christie. Christie has so many fascinating characters. I love the work she puts into her murderers and victims, but also she puts the same effort into her other characters. And then there were none. Five Little Pigs are just all-time great cast of characters when taken as a whole. Everyone is fully developed and interesting. I know she gets accused of using stock characters, and she does use stock characters from time to time, but she always gives them little quirks so they just aren't the same over and over again. And when talking about murderers, she has some of the all-time greats. The culprits in And Then There Were None, Lord Edgeware Dies, Peril at End House, just to name a few, are standouts. I could go on forever about this, but I'll say no more just to keep this video to a reasonable length. In second place, I have Niall Marsh, and Marsh is something of a mixed bag. She has some fantastic characters, and she crafted a lot of these characters based largely on people she knew or knew of. For instance, the Father Garnett character in Death and Ecstasy, Death and Ecstasy is based on a real-life scam priest Marsh's father drove out of New Zealand. Marsh biographer states she would develop characters first and then form the murder plot around them. She also has novels with great casts. She does such good character work in Death and the Dancing Footman, Artist in Crime, and Overture to Death. I do feel as if sometimes her lesser important characters are just kind of there. They're not special. She's not focusing them on them too much. In third place, I have Dorothy Sayers, purely because I remember all of her murderers. I think some of them really stand out, especially the culprits in Unnatural Death, Strong Poison, and Gaudy Night. I think overall her books have strong casts with very few duds, but I don't think they're ever as strong as Christie's or Marsh's. Her murderers radiate evil most of the time, and other supporting characters are at least somewhat memorable and noteworthy. And in last place, I have Marjorie Allingham. She does have strong cast from time to time, like in Fashion in the Shrouds and Dancers in Mourning, 
Death of a Ghost is a good one, but I never feel as if her characters are just like all time greats. It's even the murderers and the culprits, because she does a lot of thrillers and professional criminals. Like the big bads don't always come across as real to me. I think one of them from Sweet Danger is just like kind of a caricature and something you would expect from like a James Bond movie or like a comic book. I want to talk range of work, or more accurately, consistency. So let's rank their top few novels. On top, I have Agatha Christie, and there's really no one close to Christie's quality in her best novels. And then there were none, Murder of Roger Ackroyd, Murder on the Orient Express, Crooked House. No one can hold a candle to those. They're pure genius, expertly written, and the classics. I think you'd be hard-pressed to find someone who doesn't think those are like top 10 mystery novels of all time. Christie's best works are better than anyone else's, and it's not even close. In second place, I put Niall Marsh, and this was close between her and the third place person. Marsh's best works for me are Artist in Crime, Death in a White Tie, and Overture to Death, to name a few. I just think those books do more interesting and creative things than number three. I struggle to think of other mystery novels with similar plots as those, and I would much rather read those books than the others. They are genius and the best of the best of Roderick Allen. The emotions of those books run the gamut from mysterious to romantic to exciting. In third place, I have Dorothy Sayers. Her top books for me are The Unpleasantness of the Bologna Club, Busman's Honeymoon, and Strong Poison. And I think by the time you get to like the lower end of those top tier books, I would consider the best just a little bit rocky. I've talked about like the flaws of Strong Poison, which I still think is an incredible novel. Don't get me wrong, but it has issues. I don't think like Busman's Honeymoon is better than like Death in a White Tie. I mean, Bologna Club maybe, but it's still not better than Artist in Crime. And in last place, I put Marjorie Allingham, with her top titles being Corner's Pigeon, Dancers in Mourning, and The Tiger in the Smoke, all of which are fantastic, but I just don't think they come close to the best of the others. To me, I'm never going to pick those books up over the top books from the other queens. I still love them, and I think they're fantastic, but they're just not the best of the best for me. And on the flip side, we have The Worst Novels. And in first place, the best of the worst is Niall Marsh. Her bottom books are Vintage Murder, A Man Lay Dead, and Last Ditch. And I don't think any of those books are like truly awful. They're not good, but I think they all have something going for them. They all have that Niall Marsh spark of creative murder choices and do interesting things. However, I find two of them boring, however, and A Man Lay Dead has like those first book issues I've talked about before. In second place, I have Marjorie Allingham, with her bottom titles being Mystery Mile and then those like slew of late career campions. And to be honest, I'm probably higher on Mystery Mile than I was when I made that list just like a few weeks ago. Again, I don't think any of those are like truly awful books, but they're largely adventure thriller, but that's sort of what props them up a bit. They are not poorly executed. I just don't like what many of them are doing. And Allingham makes like odd choices within them, but they don't fail as books. They don't really succeed, but they don't fail. And in third place, I have Dorothy Sayers. Her bottom ranked books are Five Red Herrings, The Nine Tailors, both of which I I just simply do not like. They are extremely difficult to get through with Five Red Herrings having issues of fair play as well, and just like being really boring. And Nine Tailors is also really boring, but they both have like an interesting plot. I would enjoy these books a lot more if we didn't get like all that stuff about bells and like Scottish accents and paints and all that. There is a germ of a good plot there. It's just that we don't get to experience that. Sayers doesn't bring it out as much as she should. And in last place, believe it or not, is Agatha Christie, with her works like Postern of Fate, Passenger to Frankfurt, and The Secret of Chimneys being, like, really bad. I I think Christie's inconsistency can be chalked up to her just having written twice as many books as the next most prolific queen of crime, and her failing mental acuity in her later years, but she just has, like, a lot of clunkers, even throughout her career. I know, like, early on, she was just, like, writing thrillers really quickly to meet contract obligations, but that's not the case with, like, Destination Unknown, which is mid-career, and even her mystery novels from time to time, like Hickory Dickory Dock and At Bertram's tell just like don't work and christy has entire novels that make very little sense i don't think the other queens of crime do they may have aspects of 
novels being nonsensical, but I don't think they have like entire books as bad as like Poster to Fate and Passenger to Frankfurt. Entertainment value. There are so many books with good mysteries that just aren't entertaining, and I think this is an underappreciated factor in mystery writing. In the top spot, I have Agatha Christie. Christie's humor is, I think, something rarely discussed, but Poirot and his mannerisms and the occasional loose grasp of English idioms are always a lot of fun. Both Poirot and Marple have some like really sick burns and backhanded compliments. Poirot at Hastings and Miss Marple at a lot of people, but most notably Raymond West. Her plots always have this like bit of irony to them, and she slogs a lot less than the other three. In second place, I have Niall Marsh. And again, this was close here. I think Alan's personality is, like Christie's writing, under-discussed. Alan has this reputation of being dull, when that's not the case at all. He's actually extremely funny, occasionally pulling pranks on the likes of Fox and Bathgate. He offers a lot of humorous commentary about things. Troy is also a lot of fun. A lot of Marsh's characters are humorous, over-the-top personalities, and they add a lot of fun and enjoyment. Overture to Death has a lot of these funny moments, and Alan Troy's commentary about debutantes and death in a white tie is a lot of fun. I mean, some of her murder methods are intriguing and very unique, and they stand alone in terms of like creating this intrigue with that. In third place, I have Marjorie Allingham, and this was also tough because I was initially inclined to say Allingham is the least entertaining, and I do stand by that, but I also think Allingham has less boring segments than Sayer does. And Lug is always a lot of fun. I, I find Campion's heroic feats to be very entertaining and thrilling. And in last place, I have Dorothy Sayers. And like I said, I think Sayers is generally more entertaining than Allingham, but she has too many instances of just slogs. And her books are sometimes full of really dull history lessons. Like The Nine Tailors is just so boring. And I think it might be the most boring book from any of the Queens of Crime. I never read that book. I, I, she always has these like other parts of like five red herrings about train timetables, which is just not fun. I, I can point to more and longer boring sections of Sayers than I can do with the other three queens of crime. This next category was very easy to me, and it's historical importance. Obviously, Christie is number one. Her influence has inspired probably thousands of writers filmmakers, etc., are not always in the mystery genre either. Her twists, while not always her own original creations, are oft repeated, and almost every work of mystery fiction out there pays tribute to her in some way. She's everywhere. She's the best-selling novelist of all time. And then there were none as the best-selling novel of all time. Her influence is present every day. Britbox is just full of her adaptations and is constantly creating new ones in, like, the BBC and where else. The other three queens have really fallen off in this regard. Although all four are still popular, they are all still in print and easy to find. In second place, I have Dorothy Sayers. Sayers is very clearly the next most influential. I think Lord Peter Whimsey is probably a commonly recognized name. Strong Poison is a well-known book. I think most people would hear the name Lord Peter Whimsey and know who that is. There are a few Christie haters out there, and those very few people like P.D. James prefer Dorothy Sayers. And Sayers is influential in other areas outside of mysteries. She has a popular translation of the Divine Comedy, so that's something. In third place, I have Marjorie Allingham, who I think her influence is about the same as Sayers, but her and Campion being just slightly less well-known. I think because her books are less murder-focused, her legacy just isn't as large as Sayers. And in last place, I have Niall Marsh. And this was tough because I feel as if Marsh's legacy is larger than the last two, but I think she's clearly the least well-known queen of crime. Her works haven't been adapted nearly as many times as the other three. She has a lot of books that have yet to be adapted. And I think because Marsh's estate is based primarily in New Zealand, it just gets less attention from being away from the larger markets of the US and the UK. And I think those two big countries are more interested in their own authors. Marsh has a lot of theater work, which was really her passion. I actually do think her legacy is more present than Sayers and Allingham, but I just think she's less influential. I don't think any of her book titles are easily recognizable by the general public, and I'm talking about like non-readers here. I know a lot of people don't know how to pronounce her name, which I think is also an indicator she's just not that influential. And the final thing to talk about here is the denouements, how they wrap up their stories. In first place is, of course, Agatha Christie. 
we always get these like great summation gatherings where everything is explained. Christy rarely leaves us hanging. She explains everything in very clearly and detailed explanations. It's like a thrilling roller coaster, and it's quite the experience. Christy always is able to juggle so many balls at the same time. She has complex plots and is able to explain them in such simple terms. In second place, I have Nio Marsh. And Marsh does the same thing Christy does, but I think her endings are just a little less fleshed out. She does often do the summation gathering, but just not as long and detailed as Christy. I don't think they are as shocking either as the murderer has already been arrested by this time, so we don't have like the dramatic reveal. In third place, I have Dorothy Sayers. How we always get an explanation from her, but we don't always get it in like a neat little package like Christy and uh marsh whimsy novels just unfold differently but we always get the detailed explanation in full and in last place is marjorie allingham from whom we almost never get a summation gathering we're always told what happens and she never leaves us hanging and we are always told how it unfolds but it's just it's just different types of novels here so we don't get the same ending we rarely, if ever, get that like facepalm moment at the big reveal. I'm always left wanting just a little more from Albert Campion in this regard. And the final totals are Agatha Christie in first place with 44 points, Niall Marsh in second place with 34 points, Dorothy Sayer squeaks into third with 22 points, and Marjorie Allingham in last place with 20 points. I mean, for me, the real contest was always for third, and this close result between Marjorie Allingham and Dorothy Sayers really just mirrors what I thought would happen. And that is it for this video. Make sure you like and subscribe to keep up to date. And let me know who you think the best queen of crime is or what your order would be, as I suspect most of you do have Christie on top. Next week, I will be reviewing a Christie novel, Three Act Tragedy. 2024 is the 90th anniversary of the first publishing of Three Act Tragedy, or Murder in Three Acts, so stay tuned for that. Until next time, Mystery Files.